Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> thank you for joining the FLIM session of the Multi Photon Conference of the Photon Express 21. Thanks also to Amasi Pariasami and the organization team for giving me the opportunity to give this presentation there. So thank you once more. And the uh, title of the of the talk is Metabolic Flim at the Dawn of Clinical Application. So I will raise the question, is Flim able to detect tumors? Tumor detections are, for, of course, cl closely related to, to metabolic Flim. How will we get metabolic information from Flim of NADH and FAD? I will say something about the fluorescence decay functions and how they change with the metabolic state. I will show you how NADH and FLIM lifetime images can be detected simultaneously. And finally, <clears throat> I will show you some results, FLIM of excised human bladder tissue. So if you ask people, can FLIM detect tumors? Usually you get the odd answer, yes. You see on the right, you see a beautiful image. It shows a tumor in a mouse recorded with one of our FLIM systems. And certainly you see that the tumor in the middle of the image has a different lifetime of the, than, than the uh, tissue around. So that's correct. But if, it, if people think they can detect tumors by FLIM, there are normally a lot of conditions and restrictions many people will admit some tumors, okay, they may have shorter lifetime than the healthy tissue. Other people say they have longer lifetimes. So there is no really consistency in these results. And the question is why? Are the tumors just too heterogeneous or are there simple mistakes? So of course we have to clarify this before we can do any reasonable tumor detection. So. Natural fluor force in biological tissue, I think you know this. The most important ones are NADH and FAD. They are important because they have technically easily accessible excitation and emission wavelengths. And NADH and FAD are coenzymes and they are involved in the cell metabolism. So both NADH and FAD are fluorescent. And, and this is important, the fluorescence decay functions depend on the metabolic state of the cells or of the, and, or of the tissue. So what in detail happens? NADH and FAD both have a bound and an unbound component. For NADH, the unbound component is the fast one. The bound component is the slow one. For FAD, it is the other way around. The fast component is the bound one, and the unbound component is slow. So when the metabolic state changes, you have more bound or unbound FAD and NADH. So as the metabolism changes from, from oxidative to more reductive, you see that in NADH, the amplitude of the slow component goes down, and in FAD, it goes up. It just goes the other way. Good. So I should warn you, there is still a lot of disagreement about these things, especially the mechanism of these changes is disputed for us at the moment. This is a purely academic question. We know, that's for sure, that the decay function definitely changed with the metabolic state. The metabolic in, metabolically induced changes primarily cha uh, cause changes in the amplitudes, A1 and A2. And, and this is really important for NADH and FAD, the effects go in opposite directions. And I think that these two things are the biggest reason or the most frequent reason actually for inconsistent metabolic flim results or inconsistent tumor lifetimes because if you don't clearly separate the signal of signals of FAD and NAD and they go in the different directions then of course the outcome is totally undefined you if the the whole thing changes to glycolysis then 
anything can happen depending on whether you're seeing more NADH or more FAD. So this is more probably one reason. So what we have to do is we must clearly separate the signals of FAD and FAD. And we should determine the amplitudes of the, of the decay components, not an apparent lifetime and also not the lifetimes of the individual components because these depend on a lot of other things as well. They depend on, any, on pH, on binding to proteins on the type of the proteins. You can't rely on the fact that they are possibly constant in different types of tissue. So therefore we need double exponential decay analysis. Otherwise we can't obtain the amplitudes of the components. And to do double exponential decay analysis, we need extremely clean decay data. We need high sensitivity to get the required numbers of photons, and we need high time resolution. And probably not surprising, we use our own TCSPC FLIM technique for that. So the technique is actually a combination of TC of multidimensional TCSPC in a laser scanning microscope. The sample is excited by the pulse train of a high frequency pulse laser. It's either a picosecond diode laser, you can also use titanium sapphire lasers. You scan the sample with laser beam. The fluorescence light goes back to a detector. The detector delivers an electrical pulse at the detection of every photon. We then measure the time of these photons after the laser pulse and we measure the position of the laser beam in the sample in the moment when you detected the photon. So from these three pieces of information, we build up a photon distribution over X, Y, and the time in the laser pulse period. And this is our lifetime image. The advantage is we get wonderful images. The scanning process suppresses out of focus signals and it also suppresses scattering. We get clean images from a defined focal plane. This is very important to get reliable results from cells and tissue and anything in microscopy. The other thing is we have near ideal photon efficiency, of course, because every photon which is detected by the system also ends up in the result. We have very good time resolution and we have a complete decay function record in every pixel, not just something like a lifetime value. So all we have to do is to fit the curves with a double exponential model and we have A1 and A2. So that's okay. Still something missing. Yes, the problem is we have to separate the signals of NADH and FAD. And that there's where the real problem is. You have to excite the NADH at short wavelengths, something uh, typically around 370 nanometers and detected here around 450 nanometers. At the same time, of course, you excite also FAD. This is unavoidable. That means you shouldn't detect to wavelengths longer than about 475 nanometers. Otherwise you will contam contaminate the NADH signal with FAD. And when you detect, want to detect the FAD, you can't excite here because then you excite a lot of NADH as well and you don't get a clean FAD signal. So you have to excite at longer wavelengths. We use 410 nanometers and <clears throat> detect the signal from something like 490 nanometers up to avoid that we mix it with, with NADH. So does it work and how does it work? There's still one issue. We are in live systems and live systems can change. So we want actually to excite and detect NADH and FAD simultaneously. So we want to multiplex the laser wavelengths and the detection wavelengths at, at a high speed. So what we are doing is laser one, laser two, laser one, laser two, laser one, laser two. And at the same time, we are detecting either the FAD or the NADH. So it's something like this. So we're doing this by using two TCSPC modules. We multiplex the lasers and every photon actually gets an identifier which tells the system whether it was 
excited by laser one or laser two. The TCSPC system then builds up actually four photon distributions for all these combinations. The interesting ones for us are these excitation 370, emission 422, 470. This is the NADH and excitation at 410 and detection at longer wavelengths. This is the FED. So, how does do the results look like? Here's something. This is NADH. This is FAD. Here's the fluorescence decay of NADH. Here's the fluorescence decay of FAD. And if you're a little bit familiar with the typical decay times, uh, component decay times of these compounds, you see indeed, okay, this looks like a NADH decay function. This looks like an FAD decay function. Are the data good enough to derive the amplitudes from it? Yes, these are the amplitude images. Here we have an A1 of 0.66, and for the, and for the FAD, it's 0.95. It's usually much higher for the FAD. So are we seeing the expected metabolic effects? This is NADH. This is FAD. This is these are cells which are mostly normal cells, and these are tumor cells. So what are we seeing? NADH, distribution of the, of the amplitude A1 in the tumor, it shifts to larger values, exactly as we predicted. The FAD, it shifts to shorter values, also as predicted. And what we even see is in the FAD, where I said this is mostly normal, this sample contains a few tumor cells. This is one. And you see indeed that bump in the distribution here, which comes from, sorry, from these tumor cells. And it's exactly by the same, at the same A1 value, which we get in the tumor. So this looks good. Can we use it? We took our flim system, put it in a car, drove to the university clinics in Freiburg, and they have patients which were diagnosed with bladder cancer. The patients obtained a surgery there. The excised material went to our flim system. We recorded a flim image from these cell dishes. We just had five minutes time. The histology guys were standing behind us and eagerly to get the samples. And after five minutes, the material had to go to histology. So what were the results? And this is really interesting. We had seven patients of which the flim image, images were of, of, of reasonable and, and meaningful quality. We don't always get good, good, good enough samples. This is a problem that still has to be solved. So endoscopy said for this patient, healthy, healthy, to, I, by the way, I don't know why this patient got a, got a surgery, maybe other reasons than cancer or something like that. So healthy, healthy, tumor, 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 tumor. Flim said, healthy, healthy. This may look a little bit suspicious, but it's by far not a tumor. Healthy, healthy, a few tumor cells, this is here. And this is clearly tumor. We based our diagnosis on the distribution of A1 in the images and everything which has a maximum of the A1 lower than 71% is according to our experience is good tissue. If it gets, gets higher, it's tumor. So you see here, this has a long tail comes from these cells. These cells are alone are probably or surely above 71% and this is clearly above 71%. So, this was our diagnosis. And then histology results came in. And this is interesting. Histology said healthy, healthy, inflammation, 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 low grade tumor, tumor. So it is a perfect confirmation of the FLIM results by histology. What do you want more? So in, in the situation is like this, we have, uh, flim technique uh, around. 
which can be used in clinical applications. And the good thing is we don't need a clean, clinical instrument for that because it's not really used at the patient, it's used at the excised material. There's no special sample preparation necessary. The technique fits well into clinical procedures. There's no conflict with histology. And the result is actually available within minutes. For histology, you have to wait a couple of days or a week or something like that. So this could really cause a revolution in, in checking excised tissue and it would be a good supplement to a traditional histology. So this works well and probably you are now expecting that I'm doing the same thing for the FAD. But there I have to disappoint you because the FAD didn't work as well as the NADH did. So the expected effects were found. I showed this before. But in tumors, you got extremely weak FAD signals. And in fact, it, that our flim systems are very sensitive. We always detect something. But in high-grade tumors, in the FAD images, we're actually detecting more dirt than cells. So this is not, these are not really useful data. So we still don't know why this happens. Are the, the FAD concentrations very low in tumors or is the redox ratio so low that the FAD is no longer fluorescing? We don't know, we have to find this out. We hope that we uh, can squeeze out a little bit more information from these dirty data by our new SPC image data analysis. But we need also more data. And these are hard to obtain in Corona times. So probably these results have to wait for better times. So this is the end of my presentation. As a summary, yes, we believe TCSPC FLIM is able to identify tumor cells via the amplitudes of A1, get reliable identification. The A1 images show tumors more reliably than conventional endoscopy. The results we have obtained so far are in perfect agreement with histology, but I apologize, the use of FAD data requires some further investigation, which may even be including the, some research on the FAD itself. So we thank our colleagues from the University Clinics Freiburg. We also thank the German BMBF for supporting this project financially. And for more information, please take a look in our TCSPC handbook. With that, I'm at the end of my presentation. I thank you for your attention. And thank you, thank you, thank you. See you probably next year in person.